Now, one of the highlights, and we touched on this this last weekend, one of the highlights of the Bible is how God has chosen to use human beings in his plan of salvation. How he uses humans for his purpose, his glory. He could have chosen, just if you you think back of his plan, he could have chosen angels, and angels just get things done. Not, Not the demonic realm, but the good angels. They just get things done. They do exactly what they're told when they're told. He could have chosen Uh, And in some cases, you know, you'll read through the Bible, we know that angels do what they're told because we see, in many cases, God using angels. He could have accomplished things God, he could have himself. And indeed, some cases, he does just that and intervenes and takes care of themselves. But an overarching theme throughout the Bible is how God uses men and women as a part of his unfolding history. And it's continuing on today through you and me until Jesus returns. You can jot it down. Let me read it to you. Second Chronicles chapter 16, verse 9. It talks about the Bible. It, it, the Bible talks about God where his eyes of the Lord are running to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. Those whose heart is loyal to him. You know, when I read that, there, there's a part of me that just says, man, God, if your eyes are going to and fro even now, let them stop here. Show yourself strong on behalf of us, God. Let us be the kind of people that you will stop and pause and pour out your Holy Spirit upon and use us in these last days. Don't let your eyes flow through our church or flow through our homes or flow through our classrooms or flow through our basements or don't let his eyes go through and across us and then just pass us up. We want to be used in the days in which we live. And in Samuel, we meet a couple of men that God used. And one, a man by the name of Samuel. We actually meet him as a baby uh, in the womb. We meet him and through his mom who was barren without, a ch- without children, desperately seeking God's will for her life. Another man we're going to meet in the book of Samuel is a man by the name of David. And these two men were used in tremendous, incredible ways, in a positive way, for the purposes of God with all their, fa- fa- with all their faults and failures. But we also meet Saul. Israel's first king, a man whom God could have used. Listen, just point this. We're not going to get into much in Saul so early in the book, but we will eventually. This is a man, and you don't want this said about you. Saul was a man that God could have used in tremendous ways, but his sinful decisions rendered him unusable. So between David, Samuel, and Saul... We definitely don't want to be Saul. We don't want to render through our sinful decisions ourselves unusable. And through our study of these men and all the other folks that are woven in between, we're going to learn a lot about what it means to have a heart for God. The good news about how God uses people is that we know that God can use us. Remember in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, he said that God has chosen the foolish things of the world, the weak things of the world, the base things of the world. Why? So that after God is done using them, he gets all the glory and no one can glory in his presence. So God uses us. We've learned that. We've seen that. And perhaps many of you have experienced how God will use you. That's the plan of God for his church. Now, let's turn over there just for the sake of review and read through in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Picking up in verse 26, just by way of a background to jump into our study in 1 Samuel. This is the plan of God for his church. To have a group of men and women, not many of them wise, not many of them strong, not many of them noble. Now understand this for a second. Now you you kind of look at your life and you think, well, you know, I'm not necessarily in those categories. Not that you think too highly of yourself or prideful, but just the fact that that maybe you are well educated. And you go, well, does God, does that automatically write me off? Of course not. God will use the strong and the weak. God will use the wise and not the wise. It's not, he doesn't say, let me, let me emphasize this. Not that, again, not that we're prideful, but if you happen to be in a place where your, your family heritage is of a noble character, or you have been well educated because you've just been blessed to go through the education system, and you have degrees and you're able to, just, or maybe you're self-educated. It's not, you know, wise, strong, or you, you might be a stronger type of person. You might come from a stronger, you know, upbringing, or you might even be physical physically stronger than most. It's, it's not that we're looking for things to write ourselves off. We're looking for ways in the Bible to include ourselves. Maybe that's your perspective in life where you are quick to write yourself off. 
You know, people saying things about you as you're growing up or the kind of upbringing and being put down or you've experienced a few failures and you're a little tired of failing and you might even identify yourself now as a failure and you don't want to look, way, look for ways now that you're redeemed. Remember we learned this last week where if, you, if somebody asks you who you are, you could say like John the Baptist, I'm just a voice or you can bring it into the New Testament and say, well, who are you? You could say this, I'm a new creation in Christ. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things, I'm a new person. And I I may have failures, but I'm not a failure. I I am not a failure in the eyes of God. He has redeemed and continues to redeem my failures. So that in him, even when I fail by faith, I'm victorious and strong in him. That little bit of a mind change where you read through and you, you, you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26. For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh. And you go, well, that's me. Yep. I'm not wise according to the flesh, or not many mighty, or not many noble are called, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. And you go, yep, that describes me. And you can describe yourself, you can use that as a positive or as a negative. You can just look at yourself, well, yeah, you know, I mean, I can describe myself as a foolish things. If you were looking for someone that, you know, 20 something years ago, you're looking for a, a pastor to, to move from Southern California to another part, of plate, another part of the country to be used of God to plant a church believe me you would not have chosen me you would have left my presence going what a fool or whatever other words you'd want to use to describe so I know looking back at my past I see what God has done in my life he gets all the glory now of course if you didn't know me back then some people as you share things and I get little tidbits of what what my life was before I got saved there are some people that just don't believe me believe me it's even worse than I describe it God is that good The Bible says, I think it was D.L. Moody that said, um, he described it, that God will go to the guttermost. You know the phrase, the, the gospel goes to the uttermost, but you know God will also go to the guttermost so that he can show himself strong. So be careful, would you? Please don't write yourself off. Please don't artificially put yourself down. You know why? Because that's also a form of pride. You know, pride is, is a two-way street. One way, you can think too highly of yourself. And you think, well, you know, I'm not any of these. I'm God. Of course God chose me. What do you think? Don't you know where I've come from? Don't you know who I am? That, that's, that's an easy, perceptible pride. But there's also another pride where you don't think too highly of yourself. You actually think too lowly of yourself. Where, well, the Bible calls that. There's a phrase. You'll see it now when it comes up. You can write next to it, false humility. A false humility is also prideful. And you go, well, man, what am I supposed to do? Think too highly of myself? Think, no, remember a definition of true humility is to have a right estimation or a right understanding of yourself in light of God. Where you just know who you are. You understand and accept who you are by the grace of God. Knowing that wherever you are now, God is at work in your life to change you. To take you and me from glory to glory and strength to strength. That if you will present yourself to him, a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service, through that presentation, through that cooperation, through that obedience, God will choose to use you. The eyes of the Lord go to and fro, and to that person that's ready and receptive, to that person that's humble and submissive, man, that is a powerful, you are a powerful tool, a powerful man, a powerful woman in the hand of God. And so God does choose the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise, verse 27. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. And God has chosen, verse 28, the base things of the world and the things which are despised God has chosen and the things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are. So, verse 29, no flesh should glory in his presence. And notice verse 30, he says, but of him you are in Christ Jesus, who what? Became for us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that it is written, he who glories, let him glory in the Lord. Now, I hope you agree in your own life as I share this with you, but this section of scripture, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26 through 29, is the best reason and explanation in all of the Bible that I have found that explains why I serve in the ministry. This is it. It's the best answer why God would use someone like me 
why he would transform my life, where he had plans for me even more than I could perceive and still yet to come. One of the lessons that God is always showing us, God is showing me, is of his sufficiency and his strength and his power. Those of you that have memorized Zechariah chapter 4, verse 6, you know that it's not by might and it's not by power, but what? It's by my spirit, says the Lord. That was written, that was given to a man that was faced with an impossibility. It was given to a man that looked at the work that was before him and just felt his own inadequacy, his own weakness. And God came and said, you're right, Zerubbabel. You're right. It will not be your wisdom and it will not be your strength and it will not be you being able to figure this one out and it will not be able you to talk your way out of this and it won't be. And all of the things that we can look at of what we've used in the past to succeed, no, we need to learn to come to the end of ourselves so that the sufficiency of God will be all that we trust and we come to the conclusion that Paul did that I've been crucified with Christ it's no longer I who live but it's Christ that lives in me and the life that I now live I live by faith in the son of God who gave his life who loved me and gave his life for me I've been crucified with him now you're in first Corinthians let's just jump over a few pages second Corinthians chapter four. First Corinthians reminds me that God can and God will and God does use anyone, no matter what their background is, no matter what their weaknesses are, no matter where they've come from, no matter what your upbringing is, no matter what part of town you came from, no matter what language you speak, no matter what color of the skin you are, no matter what gender you are, no matter how smart, how educated, what you may bring that is inadequacy before the Lord, God will turn it around and use it for his glory so he gets all the credit for the work in your life. According to 2 Corinthians, notice chapter 4 with me, would you? Verse 7. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 7. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels. Are you the treasure or the earthen vessel? Okay, that's for um, response here. Are you the treasure or are you the earthen vessel? You're the vessel. And in you, you have a treasure. There's a contrast here. We have this treasure. We have the message of the gospel. We have the presence of the Holy Spirit in our life. We have God. We have this treasure in earthen vessels so that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. So that's the way it works. The way it works, and your life is described right now as an earthen vessel, very human, filled with treasure. That's you. I just want you to know, do you see all this fall out? In my Bible, it wouldn't have fallen out. <laughs> you, are the you are the earthen vessel, and God is the treasure. That's how it works. That's your life. You're not the treasure, although God does treasure you because he sent his son Jesus Christ to die for you. That's how valuable you are. But you're the earthen vessel, fragile and weak. In another place in the Bible, God would describe you as just dust. He's not putting you down. He's just telling you the truth. <laughs> he was fashioned and made you out of dust. And without him, you'll be dust. Because it's what's in you that makes the vessel valuable. I mean, you could hide a million dollars in an old coffee can. And that coffee can, everybody would want it. Well, they don't really do coffee cans all that much anymore anyway, huh? A coffee bag. <laughs> You know, you could find an old Tupperware that's been microwaved and discolored by the things that you weren't supposed to microwave in it. Have you guys ever done that? <laughs> just ruin it? I have. I've gotten big trouble for it from my mom when I was a kid. Just ruin it because you're supposed to take it out first. And, but that Tupperware can be pretty valuable. Pretty valuable if you put a few diamond rings in it. And here you and I are. We're this treasure holder treasure carrier and for those earthen vessels notice what you face in verse 8 we're hard pressed on every side yet not crushed we're perplexed but not in despair persecuted but not forsaken struck down but not destroyed always caring about Paul describes himself in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our body verse 11 for we who live are always delivered to death for Jesus sake that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh so then death is working in us, but life in you. And since we have the same spirit of faith according to what is written, I believed and therefore I spoke. We also believe and therefore speak knowing 
That he who raised up the Lord Jesus will also raise us up with Jesus and will present us with you. For all things are for your sakes, that grace, having spread through the many, may cause thanksgiving to abound to the glory of God. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day for our light affliction which is but for a moment is working for us a far more exceedingly an eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. And that really is the desire of our hearts in good times and in bad. We just want to direct you past us and to the Lord, to his word, to his wonderful grace. We're just vessels not looking to man, but to the Lord, where he gets all the glory. And this you will see clearly in the men and women that God uses. As you look around the room, you see a testimony of this very truth being lived out. And so we will, as we study in 1 Samuel, see the same testimony in a very different group of people, in a different time period, in a different part of history, but very true, real human beings that God used. So that after you read through 1 Samuel and you see some of the weaknesses in their life and you look at their life and you estimate and you go, wow, wow, that's amazing that God would use someone like them. And so 1 Samuel reveals for us thousands of years even before the birth of the church we're reminded and we see that God uses imperfect people. People chosen not necessarily for their successes, but in some cases it was their failures that qualified them in order to be used greatly because it was through that failure that came great humility and it was through that great humility that came great dependence and it was through that great dependence that came a crying out and a desperation before God and it was through that crying out and desperation before God that God met you right where you right where you needed to be met and he raised you up in a powerful way now in 1 Samuel Chapter 1, Samuel comes on the scene as the last judge of Israel and its first prophet. Samuel is the last judge of Israel and its first prophet. You recall, and you may need to go back for way of review, but in our study in Judges, the book doesn't end well. Actually, the whole book is very discouraging. It's a discouraging time in the nation of Israel's history, the book of Judges and Samuel. Because there is a passage of scripture at the very end of Judges, in Judges chapter 21, that describes the basic condition of the nation of Israel during this time. Let me read it to you. Uh, in, In Judges chapter 21, verse 25, it says, In those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did that which was right in his own eyes. We happen, I believe, to live in a very similar era in history where there is a a large group of people on the earth, not just our country, but a large group of people on the earth who do not have Jesus as king. And because there's no king in their life, by way of application, because there's no king in their life, everyone does that which is right in their own eyes. I would even say this. As you find some, if you find this attribute in your own life, you find this pattern in your life where you start at the end and you're starting to do what's right in your own eyes. You do what's right for yourself. You're not mindful of your decisions and how they hurt or affect others. And you're just looking out for number one. And you're just making sure number one's taken care of. And you're, and you're rallying and you're surrounded by people that just seem to encourage you. Just take care of number one and don't worry about. I would say if you back up from that statement and each time we do that in our lives or live it as a pattern, I would say that in that time you are not serving King Jesus in that time it would be the same for you in a small way and same for me that when I have no king in my life I do what's right in my own eyes I do what's right for me and Samuel comes on the scene as the last judge and the first prophet and he takes over after well after the judges were unable to bring order the book of Judges summarizes this ugly Season of doing what's right in their own eyes. There's no king. 350 years from their military strength, they slid downhill fast until there is a king in Israel. 
And we meet that king in 1 Samuel. His name is Saul. Now, the book of 1 Samuel covers, for you note takers, just some things, some background, covers about 94 years of time from the birth of Samuel to the death of Saul. Written, the author being Samuel, we see a prophetically oriented history of Israel's first monarchy. And 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 1, picks up the story of Israel that left off back in Judges. Samuel follows Samson. And he too had to deal with the Philistines that Samson didn't fully accomplish a permanent victory. And we see the transition of leadership in Israel from judges to kings, from theocracy to monarchy in 1 Samuel. God will use the monarchy, use the kingship, will use even Saul. He'll use Saul and the monarchy to bring more stability to Israel because it's easier And we see this demonstrated that it was easier for Israel to follow a man instead of an earthly king instead of God. Samuel was the king maker who anointed the first two rulers of the United Kingdom, Saul and David. Now one more thing, a few more things before we jump into these first few verses. Both Samuel and David are types and pictures of Jesus Christ. A type in the Old Testament is an imperfect picture of of, well, many different things, but Samuel and David become these types and pictures of Jesus. Samuel is a picture, and we'll see this drawn out as we study. He's a type of Christ as a prophet, a priest, and a judge. So we see that lived out in Jesus. David is a very beautiful and powerful type of Christ. David is born in Bethlehem, works as a shepherd, rules as the king of Israel. He's the anointed king who becomes the forerunner of the messianic king. His typical messianic psalms are born of his years of rejection and danger, like Psalm 22. God enables David, a man after his own heart, according to 1 Samuel 13, 14, to become Israel's greatest king. And the New Testament specifically calls Christ the seed of David according to the flesh in Romans chapter 1 and the root and the offspring of David in Revelation chapter 22, verse 16. Another thing to note in 1 Samuel, this is the first book of the Bible that uses the word Messiah. Or in chapter 2, if you want to just turn there, 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 10, it's translated in the Hebrew here. Notice, You know, Hannah is just such a powerful woman of God, too. I can't wait till we get to this section. Hannah actually, in her prayer, prophesies Messiah, where she says in verse 10, The adversaries of the Lord shall be broken in pieces. From heaven he will thunder against them. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. And so with all of this in mind, let's pick up in verse 1 of chapter 1. And boy, does the book of 1 Samuel start out with trouble and dilemma. Those of you that read ahead. Now there was a certain man of Ramthaim, Zophim, of the mountains of Ephraim, and his name was Elkanah, the son of Jeroham, the son of Eluhu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zuf, an Ephraimite. And, here's the trouble, verse 2, he had two wives. The name of one was Hannah, the name of the other was Peninnah, and Peninnah had children, but Hannah had no children. So we jump right in and we're faced with controversy in the second verse. Things in this book are messed up from the beginning. Now before we address the two wives issue, understand that the book opens up with a specific man living in a specific place, living in a specific time in Israel's history. He's living in a time when the Philistines are gaining momentum and power and military might and strength. The Philistines were an aggressive sea people whose mass invasion of the eastern Mediterranean coast made them Israel's principal enemy from the time of Samson until their devastating defeats at the hand of of David around 980 BC. The best known Philistine in the Bible is who? Goliath. That's right. We're introduced to this particular man, Elkanah. God unfolds his word in 1 Samuel as he usually does with a person, a man or a woman, or even a kid that he chooses to use. And I'm so glad that he uses us. Elkanah, we learn, is a descendant of Zuf. 
His family line shows he was a Levite, according to 1 Chronicles chapter 6. He's called an Ephraimite here because his family lived in the Levitical city within the boundaries of Ephraim, not because he was of the tribe of Ephraim. Now, verse 2 introduces to us a difficulty and a dilemma. It says in verse 2 that he had two wives. Peninnah, her name means coral or ruby, and Hannah, which means grace or gracious. Elkanah was a polygamist, or in this case a bigamist, but more than one wives, a polygamist. Bigamy and polygamy was culturally acceptable and widely practiced. And that's what we read in verse 2. We are reading the true story of a man and his two wives. Now, because something is culturally acceptable, and because something has been okayed by the law of the land, does not mean that God approves of it. Let me repeat that, especially in our own state with the decisions of our own lawmakers. Because a government official or a group of government officials change a law and make something that was extremely dangerous now something that is legal doesn't remove the danger and doesn't make it right. It's simply a change in the laws of man. And because something's culturally acceptable, because the majority of people agree or the majority, which majority is 50 out of 100 is 50 plus one. That's the majority. So that if the majority vote is 51 to 49, that means 49 people decided that wasn't good and 51 people decided that it was good. In our culture, that is what rules the day. It's unfortunate that in our culture, which is not much different from the culture of the day, and I also, you know, I, I, I like to refer not only to the culture of our country, but to the culture of our world system. This is a norm around the world. But because of the latest decisions in our own country, we have to understand that it's very similar. This is a very similar truth. The Bible speaks of Elkanah having two wives. Now, I want you to be careful in the scriptures when you're reading to not put in the Bible what it doesn't say. Because this is a difficulty. You, if you listen to our radio broadcast on a regular basis, more, more than you know, maybe once or twice every couple months, somebody's going to call and say, I don't get this. I don't understand this. I was reading through the Bible, and it's, you know, especially in the Old Testament readings, and I came across, well, I came across this passage where it says right here that Elkanah was a polygamist, and that God, you know, I saw it, and God used him, and, and he's worshiping, and God uses his wife, and, and I just don't get it. I don't understand. I mean, is, does God approve of polygamy? The answer is no. The answer is no. From the very beginning, God identified God identified the definition of a marriage that he created, a, a, a relationship that he created that he terms marriage. We refer to it as marriage today. From the very beginning, from the beginning of the order of God, marriage is clear. One man, one woman, one lifetime. Now, we recognize that not everyone lives up to that ideal, and that's unfortunate, and it's true. But God, by mentioning polygamy here, does not approve of it. Any more than you mentioning polygamy approves of it. You're just saying it like it is. You want to know about Elkanah's life? Well, let's see that God would even use a man like Elkanah. Does he approve of that? No. Does that become the norm now because of Elkanah, of all the different passages of where marriage is defined, one man, one woman, one lifetime, or Adam and Eve, and all throughout Scripture, and other sexual behavior outside of marriage between men with men, and women with women, and women with men, and fornication, and adultery, all of the sexual sin. Does that mean that now we can just kind of make up uh, new things because it is culturally acceptable? And no. The Bible is just clear here. In Elkanah's life, he was messed up. He was living according to, the, according to the cultural norm. You know why? Because of judges. Because of the leadership. When everybody does that which is right in their own eyes and live apart from a standard that God has developed, not a pastor, not a priest, not a religion, not a church, just a simple understanding of the scriptures, just a simple reading of the scriptures, you find that this is often the result. 
It's not uncommon for the enemies of the Bible to use this as an attack on the morality of God. To use it as, well, it sounds like this. How can such a moral God contain, condone such immoral behavior? I mean, if this is immoral, why does God condone it? He doesn't. Even back in Deuteronomy chapter 17, there was a direct command to the kings as an example to the country. It says in Deuteronomy 16 verse 17, neither shall he multiply wives for himself. So not only does God through creation and precept define marriage, he also defines what it's not. He defines it both in the positive and in the negative. And there's many things in our culture that our culture accepts that are not God's heart or will for you. They're destructive and hurtful. God's will for marriage, we've seen. The Bible records for us the facts. That's when you're reading the Bible and you come across, well, what is this? What's verse 2 all about? You have a God that won't hide the difficulties in the people that he uses. He, he's, this is, you know, here's the story of Samuel and David and, and Elkanah. And this is all, this is what Hannah had to deal with. Hannah was married to a man that was married to another woman. She was barren, and this other woman gave her a hard time. But God's not condoning it. The real answer to these types of questions is it opens up for a dialogue that even if we want to talk about the scriptures, I I welcome the question. I love the question. I enjoy dialoguing over these things so that when in the midst of the dialogue, I I don't want to completely cut them off. I just want to explain to them this is what the Bible says and and, and God is describing the difficulties. He doesn't, you know, you you would think it's it's one of the beautiful evidences, I believe, of the Bible, of the many, you know, the manuscript evidence, the archaeological evidence, the statistical probability of the prophetic within the Bible. There's a lot of things that hold that, that, that you can study that will that will affirm to you the evidences that the Bible that you hold in your hand is reliable, <clears throat> inspired of God. Amazing evidences. But there's another evidence that you'll see over and over again, and that is the Bible tells the truth. I mean, let, let's just think of it for a second. If you were writing the Bible, would you expose every failure and every difficulty and every issue if you were writing the book about yourself? I mean, I think you'd skip a few things, wouldn't you? I mean, wouldn't you want to? You don't want to relive it. You don't want any people asking you about it. So it's just like, well, what happened to that season in your life? Oh, no, no, we don't talk about that season. Well, why, why, why don't you talk about these? Because I'm the author of the book and I can write what I want. <laughs> and God's the author of the book. And when he writes it and he writes your story, it's, you know, it's everything. It's all of it. And, and so when he writes of Elkanah, you go, how can God use Elkanah? Well, man, in his, imperfect, in, in his imperfection, God was able to overcome his imperfection. And through that, use Hannah to bring Samuel, to bring David, to bring Messiah. I think it would be safe to say as you study through the scripture that the scriptures are filled not only with the people that God uses, but with the failures and the imperfections of the people that God uses. And God wanted us to make sure, I I believe he wanted us to understand that even in our own imperfections, a life surrendered to him, he'll use us. And so you're saying, if you're concluding today, okay, wait a minute, Ed, if God's going to write the book and, and he's going to write my name in the book of life and he's going to write my story, I guess I'm going to go get me a couple wives. The Bible doesn't teach that. The Bible doesn't condone that. And if you were to make that choice, a couple wives, a couple husbands, either way, you would be making a grave error and sin against God. In order to live a life that pleases God, you need to live a life by the precepts of God. And he's defined that for us. So God is just sharing us, hey, look, Elkanah is here, and he's got um, two wives. And notice verse 3, this man, up, man, this man went up from his city yearly to worship and to sacrifice to the Lord of hosts in Shiloh. Also the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, the priests of the Lord were there. We're going to learn about Hophni and Phinehas later, but if you like to write next to your Bible, these guys are rats. They don't belong in the ministry. And you can read ahead for yourself or you can wait, but Hophni and Phinehas are men that misrepresent God. They're taking advantage of the ministry that are hurting the people of God. And God, and you'll see with Hophni and Phinehas, they will not get away with it. They were given time and time and time to repent. They did not. They didn't get away with it. But we'll learn more about them later. Whenever the time came, verse 4, for Elkanah to make an offering, he would give portions to Peninnah, his wife, and all his sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he would give a double portion, for he loved Hannah, although the Lord had closed her womb. And her rival. Interesting how this is included. This, this, this was not a, a, a relationship that was peaceful and cool and we all get along. This was a rivalry with two wives. There was great tension and difficulty And so God wants us to recognize her rival also provoked her severely. 
to make her, what does your Bible say? Miserable. This was a miserable existence. I believe it was miserable for both women and for Elkanah. It was not only miserable for Hannah and what she had to endure, but it was miserable for Peninnah because her whole life was set to destroy someone else's life. And poor Elkanah is dealing with the consequence of what? His sin. It was a miserable home because sin brings misery. Living in sin brings misery. So her rival provokes her severely to make her miserable because the Lord had closed her womb. And so it was year by year when she went up to the house of the Lord that she provoked her. Therefore, she wept and did not eat. Now, Peninnah had children. Hannah did not. And through that became a place of provocation and misery. Every year, constantly, continually, she would not let up. Hannah was sad and sorrowful. And even though she received the double portion, and perhaps it was, it was Elkanah's way, instead of making things right, it was kind of Elkanah's way to try to appease the emptiness of his wife. And she couldn't enjoy the double portion because her heart was set on having a child. Now this phrase, verse 5, is, a, is an interesting phrase, and we need to pause here where it says, but to Hannah he would give a double portion, for he loved Hannah, although the Lord had closed her womb. I just want to speak to some of you ladies, some of you women, where I know you're in the same place. This has been your testimony. And great sadness has come to your heart because of it. Times where it's very difficult for you to perhaps even enjoy a baby dedication because it comes around a time period where either you have lost a child or you have a womb that's closed in your heart's desire or perhaps some of you single ladies that in this season of your life you're not married and you don't foresee marriage anytime soon but you're kind of waiting on it and, and while you're waiting on it the topic of children comes up and while it may not be particularly Hannah's situation or it might be there is a great difficulty when you read this you know God's sovereignty in the affairs of children is clear throughout the scriptures it's clear in dozens and dozens of questions we have for God why me? Why not me? Why this? Why now? Why him? Why her? In Genesis chapter 20, verse 17, it says, Abraham prayed to God and God healed Abimelech, his wife, and his female servants. They had bore, then they bore children, for the Lord had closed up all the wombs of the house of Abimelech because of Sarah, Abraham's wife. In Genesis chapter 29, verse 31, it says, When the Lord saw that Leah was, un Leah was unloved, he opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. So Leah conceived and bore a son, and she called his name Reuben, for she said, The Lord has surely looked on my affliction. In Genesis chapter 30, verse 22, it says, Then God remembered Rachel, and God listened to her and opened her womb, and she conceived and bore a son and said, God has taken away my reproach. So she called his name Joseph and said, The Lord shall add to me another son. So I just want you to know, ladies, if you're in a place where you could say about your own conclusion that the Lord has closed your womb, we pray for you. We pray that God's will would be done with your womb. That if you truly want to have children, we pray that the Lord would give you children. Now, we've seen answers to that prayer where wombs that have been closed, um, even just before service, I was talking to one of the families down in the cafe, and little Stephen came up to me. And, and as I, we were talking about Stephen, I introduced him as a miracle child. He's a miracle. He's a walking miracle. Because his mom and dad, for over 12 years, prayed in their marriage and desired to have a child. And they went through all that they could possibly think of in order to have a child, and up until the time that Stephen was conceived, the Lord had closed their womb. And boom, at God's sovereign timing, Stephen came. And there he was. Well, he's walking and running around the church as a testimony to the Lord. Now, I've seen that, and we rejoice. My own pastor, my own children's ministry pastor, the man that God used in a great way to disciple me for many years, he and his wife also experienced many, many years of barrenness, even to the point where they were ready to adopt, and right before they were ready to adopt, she conceived, and the Lord took their life in another way. And like Stephen, who now has in that closed womb two more brothers, and there's three kids in that family now, just like with my friend Rudy, same thing. He has a daughter, and God gave him a second daughter. And so sometimes we see God's answer in prayer to a child. Other times we see God's answer to that prayer in adoption. And other times we see God's prayer to that, that no, it's not my will, God says, on this side of eternity. 
for now. Barrenness is, is hard. You, you and I, we want to learn, both men and women, we want to be sensitive to those that want to have a child and can't. We want to learn to be sensitive. We want to learn to not say something that would hurt them or harm them. But instead, instead of saying something, you know, sometimes like Peter, you know, we, we think we need to say something and we do and then we regret it. We just should pray for them. And, and if that's something that they have shared with you, then it becomes a point of contact for you to continue to pray for them and continue to encourage them and continue to seek God's will with them because you don't know. Like Hannah in this time, you know, barrenness is today is sad and it's hard, but I want you to know in ancient times, barrenness was tragic. It was a tragic, a ulti- the, you could say, as one commentator did, barrenness was the ultimate tragedy for a woman for a married woman. It was a horrific event. As you could talk to many women that are barren today and they would describe it in many, in much the same way. And yet as we continue in our study next time, you'll find and we'll see that God will use, and listen, this is very important, and you husbands of, 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 uh, of gals that are waiting to have a child and you're suffering alongside of your wife and it's, it's the difficulty in your marriage. I want you to look out for this. And again, I'm kind of giving away things ahead of time, but you can read it now with different eyes. God is going to use Hannah's closed womb in a way that she would never, ever be able to see until after the fact. You know how you're in things right now and all these things are coming to you and you go, what in the world is going on? I just want you to know that nothing's wasted by God. And while we don't see exactly what God's doing right now and we're not entirely sure why and what, we do know this. Hannah is another person in the line of history that God is going to use his, her tragedy and her pain and her sorrow the deep, deep pain of being childless in her life, to do something great, to do something grand in her life, even for the whole... I mean, if you were to tell Hannah in her sorrow and her sadness, again, the, the, the whole story is just tragic because even a pastor comes, a priest comes, and totally misunderstands her and totally puts her down and, and doesn't help her and makes things worse for her. Uh, even in that condition, if you were to say, Hannah, don't worry about it, Hannah, don't, don't worry about it, God is going to use your barrenness and you're going to be such a critical person in the whole plan of salvation. I wonder if she would have believed it. I mean, she was a great woman of faith. She loved God. She was united with God's heart. She sought the Lord. She endured great affliction and great difficulty, not just with barrenness, but the whole deal with the misery and the provocation and her husband loving another woman. She's dealing with great, great difficulty and pain. And I wonder if you, we would have told her, you know, Hannah, just, just, hey man, turn the page. What page? I, when I turn the page, it's blank. I don't see it. No, no, we're looking backwards. None of the pages are blank. But in your life, looking forward, there are a lot of blank pages. We really don't know what tomorrow will bring. We're not sure what God's going to write on the page. But with Hannah, as you read ahead and you see her life, you're going to be so encouraged Because after the fact, I mean, so encouraged, so encouraged that when she does conceive this little baby Samuel, she gives him back to the Lord, literally. Gives him back to the Lord. Why? Because she dedicated him to the Lord before he even came by faith. An amazing story. So read ahead. Be encouraged by Hannah. I know she's experiencing misery, and perhaps you are too. And I know she's experiencing the pain of seeing a rival, perhaps, provoke her. Uh, For her, it's not perhaps, but for you it might be. She's experiencing pain in particular because she is barren. And she's without child. And as we've seen in earlier studies, you know, there are those times where we just cry out for what we desire. And God says, what I'll give you is myself. What I give you is my presence and my purpose. I give you my plan. And we're going to get to the other verses in our next time together. But things turn around. Well, okay, let's just do verse 8 real quick. It says, Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Hannah, why do you weep? Why do you not eat? Why is your heart grieved? Am I not better to you than ten sons? And at that point you hear a... No, no, you don't, you don't. It's like, what are you thinking, dude? How insensitive can you be? I think he wasn't necessarily meaning to be insensitive. I think he loved Hannah greatly. But he missed it. 
So Hannah arose after they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh. And Eli the priest was sitting on the seat by the doorpost of the tabernacle of the Lord. And she was in bitterness of soul and prayed to the Lord and wept in anguish. And she made a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your maidservant and remember me and not forget your maidservant, but you'll give your maidservant a male child, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life and no razor shall come upon his head. Wow. Now, we read that and we think, wow, I would do the same thing, Lord. If you give me a child, I will dedicate his life to you. I will, I will raise him in your ways. I will teach him the scriptures. I will give. But, but that's not what she's thinking. In her vow to the Lord, what she's thinking, well, we know what she's thinking because later on it happens. What she's thinking is literally giving her son to the Lord. Wow. Wow. An amazing, amazing commitment that a woman in bitterness of soul and anguish, misery and pain and sorrow and difficulty and emptiness, God fills her with himself and builds her faith through the trial and from the trial and because of the trial. Father, we ask that you would help us to grasp the reality of what we're learning here in the very beginning of 1 Samuel. We see great contrast to a country, to a nation doing that which is right in their own eyes. Elkanah being a man in that culture doing what was right in his own eyes because of the spiritual condition of the country and the leadership being poor and weak And the women in his life, the people that were closest to him, suffering because of his bad decisions. And how you interject and intervene yourself into that situation and you turn things around. And you hear the cries of Hannah. And you hear the commitment of Hannah. And you hear the heart of Hannah. And you receive the prayers. And you see the tears. And you answer according to your will. God, I pray for the precious women in our church that are in similar situations with barrenness. Or they could say that in this season right now, the Lord has closed their womb. And I pray, God, for their sorrow and sadness and for the tragedy that it is right now and the difficulty it is. Would you please anoint them afresh and anew with your spirit, God? Would you please encourage them and uplift them? Would you please give them hope and help? Would you please be with the single women of our church, Lord, where the enemy just loves to beat them up and they, they, they have a tendency at times, Lord, to face their lives with great difficulty and discouragement. Would you please pour out a spirit of, dis- of encouragement upon them, Lord, a, a cup of joy. Lord, pour out, them, pour out upon them, Lord, a, a, a reminder of your sufficiency and your love for them, that they're not defined by their singleness or by their, you know, some are single parents, Lord, and some are singles without kids, and they're not defined by their singleness. They're not defined, we're not defined by our parenting, Lord. We're defined by you in us, the hope of glory. Christ in us, the hope of glory. And give those of us that are near and dear to these precious folks a sensitivity, Lord, that we might help them, that we might encourage them ourselves, Lord, that we might come alongside of them, that we might be able to speak a word in due season like a cup of cold water. Help us, God. We live in a culture that's upside down. And in some cases, there are people just doing what's right in their own eyes. And God, I I admit to you now that we're not perfect in our understanding of the scriptures. I admit that. We don't have every single answer there is to have. And as we give these difficult Bible studies, Lord, as we declare to you with confidence and yet with compassion your definition of marriage, knowing that some, perhaps many listening, disagree with that definition. May you speak to their hearts, God. Reveal yourself to them. 
those that are in homosexual relationships, Lord, knowing full well that they care for one another, that they have, they're emotional and, and, and they, they have a, a deep abiding friendship, and yet in that relationship, Lord, you have not defined that as marriage. For those that are in sexual sin right now, taking advantage of another woman or another man in fornication or in adultery, and they hear a message like this and they suppress and push it away as if it's no big deal and as if they will get away with it or as it's not hurting anyone or it's... God, would you reveal to them that sexual sin, although culturally acceptable, is not from you? I think of the various things that have been made legal in our culture, Lord, things that are harmful and hurtful, things that while raising tax money and tax funds are certainly not raising godliness in our culture. So as believers, Lord, give us wisdom on how to navigate through a very difficult world. I'm reminded of your word that says, um, Jesus, you told us we're, we're in this world, but we're not of this world. And so I pray as we declare with confidence and surety the truths of your word that we don't become hypercritical that we see the person Lord that you died for that we don't become you know masters in the Bible and failures in relationship but that Lord you would balance the truth with grace so perfectly like you did Jesus you came in grace and truth so that Lord we can stand with confidence declaring your truth, but also recognizing that we're talking to another human being with love and compassion, Lord. And so let your spirit reign among us. Let us be people of passion and commitment to you. Let us be open to a fresh work of your Holy Spirit even now, God, among us. I pray for this weekend. Should you tarry, Lord, we will be here for many, many hours declaring your goodness by singing and teaching the Bible, declaring the life. Jesus is alive. He's alive. He's alive. Many people that have never set foot in this building will be here. Many more will be listening on the radio and watching on television at a later date, of course. But... May we be faithful, Lord, to just love on them and encourage them and be so happy that they've come because your word says, and we know the principles are there, that they will be blessed because they came. And we pray for salvation, God. Change lives, including our own. We're we're saved, but we still need change. We're not where we need to be. Transform us, God, by the renewing of our minds. Let us go from glory to glory and strength to strength. Humble us, Lord. Humble us that we might be dependent and desperate for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's stand together. And today, if you've never given your life to Jesus, then the Bible declares to you that salvation is available to you, forgiveness of sins. Jesus did come in grace and truth. And today, if you'd embrace the truth, you'll receive his grace. turning away from your sins and accepting Jesus Christ as your Savior is the only way. It's the only way. And as believers, you know, man, there's just that sense sometimes where you want to rededicate yourself, where you just want to come to a place of no turning back, where you want to come to a place that, man, I see see where I am and I I, I don't want to go backwards anymore. And I just invite you to make that commitment. I invite you to to, to give yourself wholly over to God. I invite you to surrender and give up. I invite you to, you know, the Bible says that you can either throw yourself down on the rock or the rock will crush you. And the rock speaks of Jesus. And Jesus, he didn't come to crush, he came to save. He didn't come to condemn. But those that receive him, they get eternal life. Those that reject him, man, it's not good. You're kind of living it right now, but it's going to get worse.